the greater the obstacle the more the glory in overcoming it we have quite adjusted to this new normal during this pandemic and our never say die attitude has brought us to this virtual platform on behalf of st thomas's boys school kirpo i would like to welcome you to our english elocution competition the excalibur 2020-21 before we begin let us invoke god's blessing by saying a school prayer Lord make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love where there is injury your pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light where there's sadness joy oh divine master grant that i may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love for it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life amen now let me introduce you to three teachers from renowned schools of kolkata who will judge our participants Our first judge is Mrs Rupa Sethi from Loreto Convent in Delhi. She has a passion for literature and is actively involved in school plays. Our next judge is Mr Glenn Dillon from St Thomas's Church School Howrah. He is a prominent member in the English department and takes keen interest in debating and elocution. Our third judge is Mrs Nirmala Biswas from Loreto Day School Elliot Road. She was a coordinator of the school. She has been a judge at many events. She directs plays and also trains her students for inter-school speech competition. Welcome judges and thank you so much. We are honored to have you with us. Now, I hand you over to Ms. J M Holmes who will be introducing our participants. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Oratory has always been one of the powerful ways of influencing people and swaying them like an invincible force today we have such 14 speakers amongst us who will be battle it out with the arsenal of their words emotions and reasons the contestants are tiryagish pain rajdeep chatterji aranya biswas from class 8 we have Surya Deep Maithi Ansh Tiwari from class 9 from class 10 we have a long list so from class 10 we have Jahin Sadat Molla Aniket Biswas Bilal Mohammad Abdul James Stanley Chako Shubham Rakshit Jalilul Rahman Shahzeb Alam Khan Olga Deep Datta तादीब अहमद देवाशीष दास जीष्णु शाह आनंदमय मुखर्जी खालिद हालम एंड रिहान इस्लाम मलिक हेलो एवरीवन आई एम राजदीप चैटर्जी ऑफ क्लास एट सी फ्रॉम संत थॉमस बॉय स्कूल टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू रिसाइड द पोएम इफ बाय रुडियाट किपलिंग इफ यू कैन कीप योर हेड when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too if you can wait and not be tired by waiting 
are being lied about, don't deal in lies, are being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, not talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken and stoop and build him up with worn-out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth. And everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Thank you. I'm Jishnu Shah from St. Thomas's Boys School, and today I'm here with the Merchant of Venice, Act 2, Scene 2 speech of Launcelot Gobo. Suddenly, my conscience would serve me to run away from this Jew, my master. The fiend is at my elbow, and he tempts me, saying to me, Gobo? Launcelot Gobo, oh good Launcelot, oh good Gobo, oh good Launcelot Gobo, use your legs, take the start, run! My conscience says, no, take heed honest Launcelot, take heed honest Gobo, or as aforesaid, honest Launcelot Gobo, do not run, scorn running with thy heels, for the most courageous fiend bids me pack. Fire, says the fiend. Always, says the fiend. For a heavens, rouse up a brave mind, says the fiend, and run. My conscience hanging about the neck of my heart says very wisely to me, my honest friend Launcelot, being an honest man's son, or rather an honest woman's son, for indeed my father did something smack, something good. He had a kind of taste. <laughs> my conscience says, Launcelot, Budge not. Budge, says the fiend. Budge not, says my conscience. Conscience, say I, you counsel well. Fiend, say I, you counsel well. To be ruled by my conscience, I should stay with a Jew, who, God bless the mark, is a kind of a devil himself. And if I were to run away from the Jew, I should be ruled by the fiend, who, saving your reverence, is a devil himself. Certainly the Jew is the very devil incarnation and in my conscience, my conscience is but a kind of a hard conscience to offer to counsel me to stay with the Jew. The fiend gives me more friendly counsel. I will run, fiend. My heels are at your commandment. I will run. Thank you. Good morning to my principal, sir, vice principal, sir, respected teachers and my dear friends. Today, I am going to speak on the topic, maths is the sense that we never realized we possessed. Whenever anyone around us starts talking about mathematics, the first thing that people around that person do is shrink away from him. Most people do not like mathematics. They tend to shy away from the subject and this hatred is pretty much universal for most people. Mainly because they think that maths is nothing more than using a bunch of formulas used for solving abstract problems that don't mean anything to the person in question in real life. What only a small percentage of people over the world, the ones we call mathematicians, realize is that mathematics is not a subject, but it is a sense, just like sight and touch. Just how the reality around us is perceivable due to sight and hearing, mathematics is a sense that allows us to understand realities that would otherwise be intangible to us. It is a way through which we can connect with the world, 
and see it in a completely different way than what we used to normally. Now, I'm going to talk about an occurrence which we have all seen around us so many times, yet have never really perceived properly. The shapes and patterns formed by trees is a typical example of a beautiful geometric design. And I say geometry because geometry is not just circles and triangles on a piece of paper as it is thought to be by conventional definitions. Geometry is the mathematics of all shapes around us. Now, why do I give the example of the shapes formed by tree branches? Well, it's because we humans share a similarity with it. Because all the blood vessels covering our entire body form that exact same structure. Lightning bolts also form the exact same pattern and so do river deltas. So, in the end, we are connected to plants, thunderstorms and rivers through the beautiful symmetry formed by mathematics. And this was just one out of millions of examples. Examples which we can see only if we develop the sense needed for mathematics. Elegant symmetry that each and every one of us can see and admire only if we try to. And that is why, for the beauty of it that pervades all around us, I can say and say so proudly that I love mathematics. Thank you. Hello, I am Anurma Mukherjee of class 10C, roll number 31. And today, I am about to give Shylock's speech in the Merchant of Venice. Shylock, to bait fish with that, it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He had disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked my gains, heated my enemies, cooled my friends. And what's his reason? I am a Jew, heart not a Jew eyes, heart not a Jew hands, organs, affections, dimensions, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer. As a question is, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, shall we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? But if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If a Jew wrongs a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge! If a Christian wrongs a Jew, what should his sufferings be? By Christian example, why revenge? The villainy you teach me I will execute, and it will go hard, but I will better the instruction. Thank you. Good morning teachers and dear friends. I am Jalil Rahman of Class 10B and I am going to recite the poem Television written by Roald Dahl which warns us about the excessive use of watching television. Television, Roald Dahl. The most important thing we have learned so far as children are concerned is never, never, never let them near your television set. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. We have watched them gaping at the screen, they loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. Last week, in someone's place, we saw a dozen eyeballs on the floor. They sit and stare and stare and sit until they are hypnotized by it, until they are absolutely drunk with all that shocking ghastly junk. Oh yes, we know. It keeps them still. They don't climb out the window sill. They never fight or kick or punch. They leave you free to cook the lunch and wash the dishes in the sink. But did you ever stop to think? To wonder just exactly what this does to your beloved thought? It rots the sense in the head. It kills imagination, clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes the child so dull and blind. He can no longer understand a fantasy, a fairyland. His brain becomes as soft as cheese, his powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think, he only sees. All right, you will cry. All right, you will say. But if we take the set away, what should we do to entertain our darling children? Please explain. We will answer this by asking you what use the darling wants to do, how use they keep themselves contained 
before this monster was invented? Have you forgotten? Don't you know? We will say it very loud and slow. They used to read. They read and read and read. And they proceed to read some more. Great Scott! Such wondrous, fine, fantastic tales of dragons, gypsies, queens and whales, and treasure isles and distant ships where smugglers rode with muffled oars. Oh, books! What books they used to know! Those children living long ago. So please, oh please, we beg, we pray. Go throw your TV set away and in its place, you can install a bookshelf on the wall, then fill the shelves with lots of books, ignoring all the dirty looks, the screams and yells and bites and kicks, and children hitting you with stakes. Fear not, because we promise you that in about a week or two of having nothing else to do, they will now begin to feel the need of having something to read and once they start oh boy oh boy you watch the slowly growing joy they fills your hearts they will grow so mean they will wonder that what they had ever seen in that ridiculous machine the nauseating fool unclean repulsive television screen and later, each and every kid will love you more for what you did. Thank you. Very Indian Poem in Indian English by Nizam Ezekiel I am standing for peace and non-violence. Why world is fighting, fighting? Why all people of world are not following Mahatma Gandhi? I am simply not understanding. Ancient Indian wisdom is 100% correct. I should say even 200% correct. But modern generation is neglecting. Too much going for fashion and foreign thing. Other day, I am reading in newspaper. Every day I am reading Times of India to improve my English language. How one gunda fellow throws stone at Indra Behen? Must be student unrest fellow. I am thinking. Friends, romance, countrymen. I am saying to myself, lend me the years. Everything is coming. Regeneration, remuneration, contraception. Be patiently, brothers and sisters. You want one glass Lushi? Very good for digestion. With little salt, lovely drink. Better than wine. Not that I am even tasting the wine. I am a total teetotaller. Come completely total. But I say, wine is for the drunkards only. What do you think of prospects of world fish? Pakistan behaving like this. China behaving like that. It is making me very sad. I am telling you. Really. Most harassing me. All men are brothers. No. In India also. Gujaratis, Maharashtrians, Hindiwalas. All brothers. Though some are having funny habits. Still, you tolerate me. I tolerate you. Surely, Ram Rajya is surely coming. You are going, but you will visit again. Anytime, any day. I am not believing in ceremony. Always, I am enjoying your company. Tiriya is point eight. Thank you. Have a very good day to everyone. My name is Anj Tiwari and I am from class 9B. Today I shall be speaking to you about the famous speech delivered by Sir APJ Abdul Kalam at the Indian Institute of Technology Hyderabad where he outlined his visions for India. Why is the media here so negative? 
why are we in india so embarrassed to recognize our own strength our own achievement we are such a great nation we have so many such amazing stories of achievements but we but we refuse to acknowledge them why we are the largest production of milk we are number 1 in remote sensing satellites we are the largest producer of wheat and we are the largest producer of rice look at lock dr sudarshan he transferred the tribal village into a self sustaining self driving unit but there are millions of such success stories but our media <laughs> but our media are only obsessed about the bad news the failures and the disasters you see that our government is inefficient you say that our laws are too old you say say and say what do you do about it ask what we can do for india and what has to be done to make india what america and other western countries are today thank you i am shujodhi maithi from class 9b caged bird by maya angela a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky but a bird that stops down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage his wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom the free bird thinks of another breeze and trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat forms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own but a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream his wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom thank you good evening respected principal sir vice principal sir respected teachers and my dear friends my name is aranya biswas of class 8c and i am going to recite the poem the ballad of father gilligan written by w b yeats the ballad of father gilligan by w b yeats the old priest peter gilligan was weary night and day for half his flock were in their beds or under green sods lay once while he nodded on a chair at the moth hour of eve another poor man sent for him and he began to grieve i have no rest nor joy nor peace for people die and die and after cried he god forgive my body speak not i he knelt and leaning on the chair he prayed and fell asleep and the moth hour went from the fields and stars began to peep they slowly into millions grew and leaves shook in the wind and god covered the world with shade and whispered to mankind upon the time of sparrow chirp when the moth came once more the old priest peter gilligan stood upright on the floor maverone maverone the man has died while i slept on the chair he roused his horse out of its sleep and rode with little care he rode now as he never rode by rocky lane and fen the sick man's wife opened the door father you come again and is the poor man dead he cried he died an hour ago the old priest peter gilligan 
in grief swayed to and fro. When you were gone, he turned and died as merry as a bird. The old priest Peter Gilligan, he knelt him at that word. He who had made the night of stars for souls who tire and bleed, sent one of his great angels down to help me in my need. He who is wrapped in purple robes with planets in his care, had pity on the least of things, asleep upon a chair. Thank you. I am Rehan Islam Malik, student of 10E. Today I will speak on a very important topic called Cyclone Amphan. So let's begin. Cyclone Amphan, one of the strongest storms ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal, made a landfall in eastern India near Bangladesh border on May 20 with the equivalent speed of 155 to 165 km per hour and later when it entered to Kolkata at a speed of 100 km per hour, it was hit very badly. The trees and power supplying poles were fallen down like mastics in everywhere. The houses were ripped apart, but fortunately, millions of people from Bengal were evacuated ahead of the storm's arrival despite of COVID-19 lockdown. Mobile and other broadband services went off along with many rural and urban areas where without electricity and power supply. The NDRF team and the army were deployed at the city of Kolkata. The central government of India announced rupees 1000 crore of the management of this disaster along with 5 lakh compensation for the dead people. So at the end, my personal opinion is whether it is COVID-19 or Cyclone Amphan, if we Indians stand together, then we can face any problem. So thank you very much. Respected Principal Sir, Vice Principal Sir, Teachers and my dear friends, I am Aniket Biswas from Class 10B and today I am going to tell a speech by Portia from Merchant of Venice, Act 4, Scene 1. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, where, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above that separate sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. An earthly power doth then show likest gods, where mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much the, to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow the strict court of Venice, must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Thank you. Respected teachers and judges, I, James Chani Chako, from class 10B, am going to recite The Cold Within by James Patrick Kinney. The Cold Within by James Patrick Kinney. Six humans trapped by happenstance in bleak and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood or so the story is told. They're dying fire, in need of logs. But the first one held us back. For of the faces around the fire, she noticed one was black. The next man, looking across the way, saw one knot of his church and could not bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use? To warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight. For all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain. Giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. Their logs held tight in death's still hands was proof of human sin. They did not die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. Thank you.
Good morning, Principal Sir, Vice Principal Sir, respective judges, and my dear friends. Today, I, Tadi Ahmed of Class 10B, will recite the famous speech of Martin Luther King Jr. of 1963. I say to you today, my friends. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of the former slave and the sons of the former slave owner will sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Sipi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. I have a dream that my four latest children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with his vacious racist, with his governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls like brothers and sisters. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, and the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black and white, Jews and Gentiles, Protestant and Catholics, will be able to join hand and sing the words of old Negro, spiritual free at last. Free at last, Almighty God, free at last. Good morning, Principal, Vice Principal, my dear teacher, and to all my judges, I am Khalid Anim, and I am here to talk to you about the United Nations, a script written by Palki Sharma Upadhyay. And the body which I am going to talk to you about is a body which is progressing from failing to fail. If you would have concerned about the United Nations, you would have been aware that the 75th UN General Assembly session took place six months back. The most unconventional, perhaps one of the worst in the United Nations history. The UNGA this year was largely an exercise in Zoom diplomacy, a series of pre-recorded videos of world leaders speaking from the office deck. Some used the forum to campaign for an upcoming election, some others tried their hand at comedy. The UN Secretary General could be more confused. The United Nations today's life have now become a platform for countries to abuse each other, forum for the world leaders to impress the domestic audience and tell others what to do. They come, they quarrel, they lecture and life goes on. Now pause for a moment and ask yourself as survivors in the United Nations form. The UN website lists a few points I think most of us will recall studying them in our civics textbook. The UN raised Odetta to maintain international peace and security, to arbitrate armed conflict, to prevent wars from happening again, and to ensure a better future for the world. But has the UN delivered on these lofty promises? The short answer is no. The long answer as follows. The UN and its dysfunctional organs have systematically failed to deliver any decisive action in the world's most troubled region. Cuba, a country famous for arbitrary imprisonment and arms fair trial, Venezuela, brutal dictatorships, and China, don't even need to tell you what China does, is one of the most peace-loving, virus-spreading country in the world. The United Nations failures are monumental. The body has provided cover for some of the world's most inhumane regimes. The United Nations has, in similar fashion, stood by during episodes of genocide around the world, be it Rwanda, Congo, Yugoslavia, and Cambodia. The list is long. The United Nations has failed the victim of genocide way too often. The United Nations peacekeepers usually entered the scene after a conflict was ended, a thousand of civilians has been killed. 
In some of the cases, they themselves have been found guilty for some of the world's most horrendous crimes. And that's not all. It has failed in another poor mission, solving disputes, be it decades-old Israeli and Palestinian conflict, or the ongoing civil war in Syria and Yemen. The United Nations peace peoples have gone to these countries and have failed to deliver. Now, which of the United Nations body is taxed with solving this disputes and conflict? Respected teachers and my dear friends, today I am going to recite the speech of Swami Vivekananda, which he gave in the Chicago Conference. So here I begin. Sisters and brothers of America, it fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of religions. And I thank you in the name of millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. My thanks also to some of the speakers on this platform who referring to the delegates from the Orient have told you that these men from far off nations may well claim that the honor of wearing to different lands the idea of toleration. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. Many respected principal sir, vice principal sir, teachers, judges, students and my dear friends. I Subham Raksit study in class 10B of St. Thomas's Boys School, Khidipur. I will be reciting the famous speech given by Mark Antony after the assassination of Julius Caesar in the play Julius Caesar written by William Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus had told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously had Caesar answered it. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then? To mourn for him? O judgment, thou art fled to Brutus beasts. Good morning, principal sir, teachers and my dear students. Congratulations on rising to the occasion so efficiently. It was a pleasure to hear your young voices. The pieces chosen were really excellent. And it was really refreshing to hear you recite them, giving it your own personal interpretation. Some of them were articulated also very well. What you need to remember, children, is when you are making your selection, you've got to remember that the audience should be able to visualize the drama, the action, the emotions that is uh, expressed in those words. So when you are choosing a piece, it would be advisable to choose a piece that packs in that necessary punch. You know, It has the scope to be able to help you to elocute it to such an extent that the audience can actually uh, visualize what you are saying. Sometimes it might need a little exaggeration also. The emotions expressed need to be exaggerated so that it creates a more powerful impact on your audience and it makes it more interesting. Otherwise, children, I thought you were very, very good. Congratulations once again. Thank you to the principal and the teachers. And thank you especially, Miss Rosie, for sending those pieces to me. Uh, I know I delayed a little in assessing them, but thank you very much once again. It was really my pleasure. Uh, have a good day, children. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mr. Dillon. Firstly, I would like to thank your principal, as well as your teachers from your senior department, for having me judge your elocution contest, your online elocution contest. 
it was enjoyable listening to each of the participants english was of high standard many excelled in their speech it doesn't mean to say that the others did not but overall when you have a competition you will have a winner but each one of you should understand that taking part is bigger or greater than winning that means each one of you are winners and that's exactly what i want so much of confidence so much of uh, enthusiasm that was put into the speech and i really liked it and i'd like to thank you all once again for having me over as your judge thank you very much good morning everyone i would like to thank the authorities for giving me an opportunity to be a part of the elocution activity of st thomas's school it was a pleasure listening to each participant the selection of the poems and speeches were excellent and appropriate related to humanity and its circumstances congratulations and wish all of you the very best special wishes to the students who will be appearing for their board exams thank you one and all it is possible through detachment to gain knowledge that is useful but only through participation is it possible to gain the knowledge that is helpful everyone who participated or participates in any eventual event is a winner for today's event we have finally been able to select three very special prize winners taking the third place we have orgudeep datta of class 10b in the second place we have jishnu saha of class 10b again taking the first place we have rajdeep chatterjee of class 8c